Hello everyone and welcome. Beside me is the latest addition to my garage. This is the 2018 Nissan Leaf. And you're wondering, Jason, what's going on? Well, last year, many of you probably saw some of the videos. I did a five part series with Formula E talking about electric car technology and electric car racing. And this year we're taking things up a notch. So we're gonna do another five part series, but instead of just talking about electric cars, I'm going to be living with an electric car. So for the next six months, this Nissan Leaf is going to be a part my garage. Now electric cars are not yet a widely adopted technology. In fact in the United States plug-ins and purely electric vehicles make up less than 2% of the market. But that number has been increasing rapidly and has doubled since 2013. So a lot of people, myself included, are not familiar with what it's like living with an electric vehicle. So this series is gonna be about living with an electric vehicle as well as talking about electric car technology, the good, the bad, the unpredictable, what it's like living with this machine here behind me. So let's go listen to it rev. Okay, so when you put your foot down, you don't hear all that much, but it is surprisingly quick. This car produces 147 horsepower, an improvement of 37% over the previous Leaf, and it produces 236 pound-feet of torque, an improvement of 26% over the previous Leaf. And those peak numbers may not sound all that crazy if you were to compare them to other internal combustion engines, but this is very different how it delivers power from an internal combustion engine. So when you're reading about power and torque, you're always quoting the peak number, whether it's an electric car or an internal combustion engine. But with an internal combustion engine, that peak power that's quoted is generally just one point on the entire curve. It's usually just one point. And the same case for torque. Not always the case, but usually true for naturally aspirated engines, where that peak torque that you're provided is at just one RPM very different for this Nissan Leaf. So from zero RPM, you have 236 pound feet, and that lasts all the way to 3,283 RPM. And peak horsepower starts at 3,282 RPM. So right before peak torque dies, you hit peak power, and then you maintain peak horsepower up to 9,000, about 800 RPM. So no matter where you are really in the rev range of, you know, the usable speeds that you're going to be driving this thing at, you're going to either have peak torque or peak horsepower available. So at any point when you put your foot down, you get the maximum amount of acceleration possible. So this leads me to a discussion about jerk, which is another reason why electric cars are fun. So what is jerk? Well, velocity is the speed at which you're traveling and velocity alone isn't all that exciting. Whether you're traveling at 30 miles per hour or 60 60 miles per hour, if you're maintaining a constant speed, it's not all that crazy, your body's not really feeling anything, you're just kind of sitting in spot. So the rate of change of your velocity is acceleration, and that does feel exciting. So you know, a lot of cars can accelerate at half a G, 0.6 G, things like that, and that feels good to get pressed back in the seat. Now the rate of change of acceleration is jerk, and that is something that electric cars are very good at, because when you put your foot down, it immediately hits peak power. There's no delay and waiting for that power to be there, it's instantaneous. So the rate of change of acceleration is very fast, and that's what causes you to get planted back into your seat initially, and then you just have that decent acceleration pulling you after that. But it's that initial punch that's really fun about electric cars, and one of the big benefits that they provide, versus an internal combustion engine, uh, often the case, you know, you have to either wait for it to change gears to get it in the ideal RPM, or you know, you may have to wait for something like a turbocharger to spool up, in order to get that power. So the jerk, the rate of change of acceleration for an electric car is about as good as it can get. And because of that, you know, they're pretty exciting to drive. Now getting into a bit more detail on the battery of this Nissan Leaf, it's a 40 kilowatt hour battery, which they claim is good for about 151 miles. Now this battery takes up the exact same amount of space as the battery in the 2010 Nissan Leaf, except now you have significantly longer range. So it's an improvement in energy density of 67%, which is pretty substantial. So same exact packaging requirement and yet significantly longer range. And so as this starts to improve and and as electric cars start to have additional range, they're gonna start becoming much more popular as they're much less of a sacrifice versus other internal combustion engine vehicles where you know the range now is clearly much higher. 
Now, I'll certainly be getting into more information on this car and what it's like to drive in future videos, but I want to talk about, you know, what does this have to do with Formula E? So, Nissan is actually joining Formula E for season five, and there are quite a few manufacturers that are participating in Formula E as it's a nice test bed for electric car technology because, you know, basically the entire powertrain, with the exception of the battery, is open for development. And so, companies can test out their products, test out different ideas in a smaller space, you know, a less massive scale and try out different techniques that work and see what maximizes efficiency. Now for season five, there are major changes to the car itself. And so looking at it, you know, the two most visible changes that you see, they've gotten rid of the traditional, you know, big massive rear wing and they've also covered up the front wheels. And so, you know, looking at these two visual changes and thinking about why have they done this? Well, both of these are sources of significant aerodynamic drag. And if you think about it from a downforce perspective, you know, what are efficient ways that you can create downforce without creating a ton of drag? A wing actually isn't all that efficient at creating downforce. It creates plenty of downforce, but it also creates a significant amount of drag. And so by changing to the new design, they're actually relying much more on the diffuser. So you'll see a massive diffuser and diffusers are very efficient at producing downforce without producing significant amounts of drag. Now there's another major benefit of getting rid of that traditional rear wing and that has to do with the airflow behind the vehicle. And so in motorsports where aerodynamic plays you know a leading role in who comes in at the top of the podium versus who's coming in last where aerodynamics is very critical to the racing you know traditionally as you get closer to the vehicle in front of you in these scenarios where aerodynamics plays such a heavy role then you start to get into dirty air and by dirty air I mean turbulent air it's not you know, nice laminar flow where your front wing is doing exactly what it's supposed to. So as you start to get close to that vehicle in front of you and you start to get into that dirty air, the front of your car starts to lose grip. So your braking isn't nearly as strong and you can't turn at as fast of speeds. And so you start to sacrifice performance of your vehicle as you get close to another vehicle, which makes it very difficult to pass. So if you allow for clean airflow behind the vehicles, if you allow for efficient ways of producing downforce and you know vehicles to race very close to one another then you can make it a bit easier for drivers to drive closer to the person in front of them and therefore make it easier for them to pass so it can help improve the racing in that you know the drivers are more flexible in their following distances they can be more aggressive with it and as a result they can take more opportunities and more risk in trying to pass and so this will show itself where the drivers are able to compete more now perhaps the biggest change that's coming up for season five in Formula E is the fact that they're now going to have just one car. So instead of swapping cars halfway through the race, they will have a single car for the entire race. So the battery capacity has nearly doubled uh, and the cars will actually have more power. So in qualifying now up through for season four, they've got 200 kilowatts of power, which they're able to use during qualifying for season five, that will be increased 25% to 250 kilowatts and then during the race they will be able to use 200 kilowatts and that was previously at 180 kilowatts during the race so the cars are going to be faster and have significantly more range now the minimum weight of the vehicles has only increased slightly so the minimum weight this season for season four is 880 kilograms and for next season for season five that's going to be 900 kilograms so a 20 kilogram increase uh, but significantly more range faster cars they're hitting zero to 60 in under three seconds and they're capable of reaching speeds supposedly as high as 174 miles per hour so pretty impressive uh, the changes that have been made for the new vehicles and it should be interesting to see how the teams adapt to the new vehicles and the new regulations. Now, I certainly have some video ideas in mind which I want to create for this series, uh, but I think while I have this car in my possession, I think it's a great time to bring up other topics about electric cars. So if there are topics relating to electric cars and driving an electric car that you are interested in knowing more about, I'd love to hear it in the comments. Let me know your suggestions of what videos you think you'd like to see me make, things I could talk about. I know there's a lot of myths, uh, a lot of good information, and a lot of 
bad information out there about electric cars, so I'd like to kind of dive down and talk about the facts, uh, great information that's out there and available, and you know what it's like to drive with this electric car. A big thanks to Formula E for partnering on the series, and thank you all for watching. Again, leave your suggestions below in the comments, and I will also include some links to last year's videos where I talk about things like, you know, could you have a manual transmission in an electric car? You know, why do some electric cars only use one gear? Those kinds of questions. Uh, so we'll have links to those videos. Thanks for watching.